It's the perfect, the most perfect money we've ever had. It's the mother of all bubbles and is also the biggest bubble in human history. Over 50% of my net worth is in Bitcoin. 50%? Shame on you. That's nuts. Bitcoin is the catalyst for the largest financial revolution the world will ever see. Or it's the most dangerous overhyped bubble in the history of modern finance. We bring you both sides of the Bitcoin debate in our Coin Telegraph Crypto Duel. In this episode, Mike McGlone, senior commodity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, meets Francis Coppola, economist and writer. How sound are the economics of Bitcoin? Is Tether manipulating the Bitcoin market? Will the crypto bull market continue in 2021? Pick your side in this Cointelegraph crypto duel. As soon as I put it in the bin at home, I had a second thought, you know, in the back of my mind. You know, you've never thrown a hard drive out before. Why start now? I just told people I wanted a pizza and I want to pay with Bitcoin. I want to give you Bitcoin and you give me pizza. This will be the first ever meal that's sitting in your belly, turning in and being a part of your DNA, provided to you via Bitcoin. Trade Allies with Cointelegraph launched a $20,000 prize pool contest for the best story. To join, click the link in the description, register for a Trade Allies account, and connect an API key to enter a $10,000 giveaway. Then submit your story to win one of two $5,000 prizes. Francis, you are a very harsh critic of Bitcoin and in a recent interview you said that the Bitcoin economics don't make sense to you. Can you explain why they don't make sense to you? Okay, can I make something clear to start with? I'm critical mainly of the economic paradigm that's been built, the belief system if you like, that's been built around Bitcoin rather than of the technology itself. I do have some criticism of the technology itself, but those are minor compared to this kind of hard money economics that's been built around it, which to me doesn't make a great deal of sense. And I'd like to explain why. And I spend my life writing about finance and money and, and economics, monetary economics. Um, and I think in all the um, emphasis upon store of value, on holding for the long term, about um, Bitcoin as an asset, as a means of saving, I think what tends to get lost in all of that is what the purpose of money is. Um, and there's a fundamental conflict between treating something as a long term store of value, an asset, and treating something as a means of exchange. Because the incentive structure, around a long-term store of value that you expect to appreciate over that time does not work for a medium of exchange. It disincentivizes the spending, the buying and selling, the trade that are the whole basis of how an economy works and incentivizes what we might term hoarding, hanging on to assets and not moving goods and services around the economy. And I don't see how that is a recipe for prosperity in the longer term. So that's the fundamental conflict that I see at the, the heart of the hard money economics of Bitcoin. Lately, the, the narrative of Bitcoin as a mean of exchange has taken like a back seat compared to the one as a store of value. But I guess there are still people counting on Bitcoin in the future being as a, a valuable mean of exchange too. But I would like to know what Mike think about it. So what do you think about uh, Francis' criticism? I'm completely neutral in space. I'm, I'm, um, I'm a strategist at Bloomberg. My goal is to get markets right, but I'm more of a markets person. And um, one of the things, uh, articles I like producing is I view Bitcoin as a collectible, um, a store of value, a reserve asset. I don't view it as money. And one of my favorite um, articles I penned, I just refreshed recently, was um, titled Satoshi Nakamoto's Mistake. Bitcoin's a collectible, not cash. Because what I think what's been created here, something has declining supply and increasing demand, um, but you can exchange it much easier than you can virtually any store value in the history of mankind, like gold, on a universal basis, 24-7 um, price discovery, all that kind of stuff. That's never existed in, in, in history. Um, and to me, that's part of the reason I think, as a strategist, I don't really like to focus on is it great or not great just basically this is where the price is going and why that's my bottom outlook and i see this asset being adopted as a store value reserve asset by most of the um, increasing amount of institutions on the planet 
and I don't view it as money, it's something I'm going to be using day to day to buy a cup of coffee, you can do that. And the point is, if you want to liquidate it and um, exchange it, it's readily and easily available 24 7. And to me, that's what Bitcoin solves, is that type of problem in history where you can store some value, transport it easily, transact it easy, easily, um, and across borders and across countries and over time. Mm -hmm. Francis, so do you have any criticism towards Bitcoin as a, a potential store of value? I do a bit because I think that what's kind of built into Bitcoin is long running price stability. I know it price volatility. I know there is this view that with greater market pen penetration, volatility would decline, but that's really a bit of a punt on, on demand um, because with a, um, a, a fixed rate of increase of supply, let's put it that way for the next 120 years, halving at arbitrary intervals, um, the um, only thing that can adjust to changes in demand is price. And so you're going to see um, volatility in Bitcoin price ongoing and continual for forever, just as actually you do with inflation rates under a gold standard. It's a similar kind of problem that um, the only thing that can adjust is price. For a long term, for a store of value, it depends how long you want to hold it for. If you want to hold it for the very long term, then short term or even medium term volatility potentially isn't a problem. But that's not the only form of store of value. And, you know, if people need to liquidate their some savings for, for um, personal reasons just at a time when Bitcoin is on one of its downward turns, then they potentially could lose a lot of money. So I think we need to be clear about in what ways Bitcoin is the store of value, what sort of store of value it is. Um, maybe a very long term one but not really a short or medium term one because of the price volatility. First of all, let's just follow up on earlier. And the simple rules of markets is um, you have supply and demand, both are uncertain. That's what creates volatility. If you have certain supply, and you do, you have a certain supply schedule, that means 50% of that, that, uh, that um, inputs for volatility is already gone. So by rule, simple rules of economics and markets, volatility has to decline. So let me expand on that. Everything I do in markets is estimate supply and demand. With Bitcoin, I don't have to. I know what supply is. It's fixed. Only thing I have to worry about is demand. So by nature, by laws of economics, volatility and Bitcoin should drop and continue to decline. I think one thing people are missing, it's not a store of value yet. It's getting there because it's way too small. So I simply look at annualized volatility, 260-day volatility. If you do a simple regression on 260-day volatility for Bitcoin for the last 10 years, it's going to match gold in 2024, which is when the halving will be. The point is probably the price will be much higher. So number one, um, supply and demand means volatility must decline um, versus most other assets, partly because it's much easier to measure. Only demand matters. And number two, it's a new asset. It's not where near the, the robustness. It doesn't have a lot of futures, not a lot of players, not a lot of people knocking around bid and offer yet that you do in, in big, robust, established markets, but it's getting there. So that to me is a key thing to remember about supply, demand, and volatility. It's just a simple fact of economics. And I point out the actual trends. Volatility has been declining. And a key point also, and, and the key thing that really got me bullish 2020 was 260-day volatility on Bitcoin declined to the lowest ever versus the stock market, S&P 500, versus gold, and versus crude oil. So it's all relative factor. Remember, we had massive, last year was the biggest correction in the stock market since 1933, yet, yet Bitcoin volatility declined. So it passed the test again. So I like to point that out. And now what's the key thing about uh, scarcity and liquidity, that's the key thing that I think um, people are, needs to be pointed about, about, about Bitcoin, why it's so unique. It's scarce by measure of the defined, vol defined declining supply via code. So it's making it scarce, but it's also liquid, which is why it's so attractive, which is why the whole world of institutions are starting to jump into the space and realizing this has never existed. The, the, to me, the key risk then is the technology, which I can't really predict. So I can see there is a stark disagreement between you two guys. You, Francis, think that Bitcoin's volatility is here to stay and it will prevent it from becoming a reliable store of value. While you, Mike, you think that by economic laws, uh, Bitcoin's volatility is bound to decrease over time. If I can just clarify, I agree with Mike that actually as the market increases in, in depth, 
then you would expect volatility to decline. Okay, a bit like kind of a young stream is very fast and furious, but once it becomes a mature river, um, you know, the currents are bigger and deeper and it's not so obviously volatile. It's actually a lot more dangerous. Um, you know, undercurrents in rivers are way more dangerous than anything in mountain streams. Um, but yes, the apparent the surface volatility is not so obvious. I agree with that. Um, what I would say, though, is that um, the volatility is not going to go away. Um, like I said, it's a bit of a punt on demand, this. Um, the best example I can give, perhaps, is a housing market. Now, we are, housing markets are very managed, um, but they do suffer from really quite severe volatility, wild swings at times, and have done throughout history, and they're way bigger than any Bitcoin market. And like Bitcoin market and Bitcoin, they have a supply that doesn't easily adjust to a demand. Obviously, the supply of housing is not fixed, but it is quite limited and it's quite difficult for it to respond and one of the reasons why certainly where i live in the uk um, we actually have supply that's very that's practically inelastic because we're so restricted in what we can build um and it's pretty much accepted that the the, the wild the price rises we see in our in our housing markets are to do with the fact that there's insufficient supply and far too much demand now bitcoin is not immune from those sort of laws so if you have massively rising demand for Bitcoin, you will see massive price rises. And it is possible you could have sudden reverses. Um, so I, you know, in, in a way, it's maybe a, a view of what you consider to be volatility. I, I, I might say, yes, your price swings might get less frequent than they are at present. But when they happen, they might be a whole lot bigger than they are at present. And they're already pretty large. So Mike, as everybody else in the crypto space, you are convinced that Bitcoin's capped supply is set in stone. While you, Francis, uh, I was following some of your tweets where you were questioning the immutability of Bitcoin supply. Can you refresh for us this argument? OK, I think you have to look at Bitcoin as a technology now. And bear in mind that um, the declining supply, declining rate of increase of Bitcoin, you know, the har progressive halvings, um, don't unwind for until about the year 2140, by which time Bitcoin will be extremely old technology. The idea that, that the people 120 years from now who, don't, who aren't even born yet will decide that what matters to us about the supply of Bitcoin also matters to them. It is a, a very considerable bet, I would say, on the persistence of a technology unchanged and immutable, because that is what this depends upon, over the course of more than a century. And I don't really buy that. So my guess would be either that the, the 21 million cap just will become irrelevant uh, because the technology will be obsolete, um, or that the community will say, actually, we don't want sky high transaction fees. Um, so we'll lift the cap because, hey, these guys, you know, they were a bit obsessed about that back in, you know, the early, 20, early 21st century, but we don't care very much. So, Mike, are you not concerned that uh, the technology of Bitcoin might eventually be modified by the future generations and thus this uh, fixed market, uh, this, this, this fixed uh, supply will, will no longer actually exist? So we're in a really early stage in Bitcoin. And I'm thinking 10, 20 years, price much more likely to go higher. Technology shifting, technology always adjusts. Now, tech, like um, Ethereum, it has issues. Other, other cryptos have had issues. One thing I hear from the technology people is you never get it right the first time. And Bitcoin's been a lot of, through a lot of those, you know, knock them down issues, which it bounced right back. So um, big picture, that's a great point. Shorter term. It's in early stages of adoption. I mean, I think that's the kind of thing we worry about when, if and or when it becomes part of the gold standard and being bought by central banks, which there's evidence that's happening in some of the peripheral central banks already, most notably in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that your, your argument reminds me of some people that are already worried about Bitcoin being banned by some governments. Uh, and uh, usually like Bitcoin supporters would respond to that saying, Let's wait Bitcoin to become really big, actually, because only if it becomes big, then it might become a problem for governments. And then in that case, people should be worried about about whether it could be banned. But right now, I guess it's too early for for worrying for that. But um, 
moving on to the following topic. So uh, let's talk about institutional involvement in the Bitcoin market because as we saw, uh, probably one of the main triggers of the latest Bitcoin surge is actually institutional involvement. Uh, Mike, in your analysis, uh, in your latest analysis, you said that uh, GBTC, the main investment vehicle used by institutions to get Bitcoin exposure, is showing a rising tide supporting Bitcoin price. Uh, but what, what if these institutions are actually buying Bitcoin only for speculation purposes and uh, then they will be taking some uh, profits at a certain point? And don't you think that that would cause a major price collapse? Mike? Well, that's one of the lessons that I learned day one in the trading pits in the 80s is separating the trees from the forest. You're talking about a few potential iterations in trees that are unlikely. Um, now, first of all, GBTC is not the best way to measure what institutions are doing. That's really the U.S. massive amount of wealth in wealth managers and people like my parents who are retired in 401ks just getting in the space. It's their only vehicle. They don't typically trade. They buy and hold in a time frame usually five, 10 years. That's what I see in GPTC. Now, if you want to see the shorter term, you look at futures. But from an institutional standpoint, not only is the anecdotal, like we have Fidelity, we have the major places in the world, the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index. Every day I hear about more money tracking this index. Um, lately, it's been BlackRock. It's this the days the ticking off tr corporate treasuries like um, a micro strategy, things like that. These kind of places don't look to sell sh in the short term. And one thing you have to remember, if price goes down and there's increasing demand that increases demand. That's one thing, the bottom line that Francis might be able to relate to, the classic economist. I come from a farm background. When prices are low for corn, I might plant beans. And if they're high mm -hmm. for something else, I plant there. It's, prices really are part of that supply demand mix. Prices go down here. That's what I'm expecting. Bitcoin to probe around 30 and find more of those institutions getting back in or looking to join versus around 40. And they'll mostly say, now I'll wait and scale in. So that's the key thing to remember is, um, yeah, if there's more sellers, price go down. <laughs> but I'm a strategist, <laughs> I see more buyers. So Francis, don't you think that this massive involvement of institutional capital into Bitcoin is a reason good enough for retail investors to sleep better at night? No, I honestly don't. And, um, and I'm going to explain why. That um, big institutional investors, at the moment. Um, I mean, you have to look at the dynamics of the last year, what's been going on in monetary policy, what's been going on um, in, with governments and what's happening to interest rates. And um, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, like, like all other assets, have been driven up by the extraordinary amounts of QE that central banks have been doing. Um, so we've got institutional investors who are desperately, desperately looking for yield. They're looking for high yield assets to spice up portfolios that aren't earning anything. And um, Bitcoin is one way of adding some yields to an otherwise, to a portfolio that's otherwise earning nothing. Um, so you have to bear in mind that that's what's going through the minds of institutional investors, um, really. Um, is how they're going to deliver the returns they promised to their investors, to their, um, yeah. Um, and, um, and they will, if prices move in the wrong directions, they will run because that's what they do. They'll run to something else, as Mike said. Um, now, retail investors may not be able to get out that easily. They may not be able to protect themselves. I don't think right now that crypto is a good place for retail investors who don't know what they're doing. Just I want to expound on that. I, I view Bitcoin as a kind of the one word to describe it, accumulate. And I think everybody on the planet should accumulate um, Bitcoin um, and never think of selling it. Let's think of, remember, we're both speaking from countries that have major currencies. My friend Cliff over mm -hmm. here, he's from um, Zimbabwe. He loves Bitcoin. <laughs> there's a good reason. <laughs> and there's a sure. reason because it's been one of the few safe places that him and his relatives have been able to hold their wealth versus all these currencies in the planet that are depreciating. But I think what you described to me, Francis, is a bit of the perfect storm that's hitting Bitcoin is yeah. insurance companies. I mean, you're not getting anything in your T-bonds anymore. So you got to diversify. And what I sense is the world's investment community has realized I probably should put one or 2% in this space because if I lose it, it doesn't matter. But if it keeps doing what it has been doing, which I don't see why it should stop, it'll make a difference for my portfolio and for my clients. So we all know that there are some very harsh Bitcoin critics who are convinced that Bitcoin will eventually fail and uh, its value will go to zero. So Francis, what do you think? Can Bitcoin go to zero? I did not think 
that its price would crash to zero. You'll find that on a piece I wrote, wrote for another publication. Um, because, of, because Bitcoin's price ultimately is, is held up by faith, by belief. Um, and there is a strong core of communities, and we do have to thank the maximalists for this, whose belief is strong enough, I think, to maintain a floor on Bitcoin's price, which is above zero. I don't know where it is exactly, but it's above zero. And I think we've seen that with every previous crash, that it has not fallen to zero, because at the bottom of, of the pile, there's always been some people who will hang on to it. This is where we hold them. Can I expand on that? One thing I've been impressed by, I was no, no zealot like a convert. I was very much um, against, didn't really agree with Bitcoin five, six, seven years ago when I heard about it when it first got the price of gold. But every day that goes by and you look, I look at coinmarketcap.com and I see all these coins. There's 8,000 of them now. Most of them to me are just complete bogus. I get that. But they hold their value. Why? I don't know, but they're holding their value. There's things like Dogecoin. There's just so many of these bogus things that are holding their value. So the space is very comparable. And the Bitcoin is unique and different. It's no one else's project. It's no one else's liability. Um, but I keep, I've seen this happen. And one thing I want to bring in this conversation is this concept of crypto savings. Now, I have millennial sons. And the first crypto savings account was uh, launched in 2017. And every day that goes by that they pay 6 to 8% on holding Bitcoin, Money has to flow that way. Now, I understand it's close. There's four or five big ones now. It's close to $15 billion. But millennials, a lot of millennials who know a little bit about the space, when they hear value stocks, they say, excuse me, but I'm getting 6 to 8% of my Bitcoin and my crypto savings. Why would I consider that? Yes, there's risks. Life is about risks. But money is, will always flow to where it's treated best. And every day these things don't fail, it keeps going that way. It's sec lending from what I understand. I have, I have small amounts in these accounts just because I need to learn about them. But they're paying me six to eight percent of my on my Bitcoin. That means if you hold a one Bitcoin and it's paying you seven percent a year, in ten years from now you have two Bitcoin. Mike, in your latest Bitcoin outlook at Bloomberg Intelligence, you said that the only threat that you see to Bitcoin at this point might be a technological glitch or something similar to an off uh, to a risk off environment like the one we saw at the beginning of 2020. So these, according to you, are the only two things that could prevent Bitcoin go continue its, uh, its rise. Uh, Francis, do you see any other threats apart from these two that could prevent Bitcoin going up in 2021? I'm personally of the opinion that while we have the environment that we do, while the pandemic continues, while we continue to have um, governments and central banks pouring money into the financial system, um, everything is going to go up, including cryptocurrencies. Um, so the risk I see actually comes from things like Tether, where I think that those and, and also the excessive type of leverage that we're seeing in, in, in DeFi and things like that, actually, because those things can end very badly. And when they do, you tend to get a crash in the underlying assets. So the question is whether we're building up the kind of, of um, fragilities that we had in the, in the housing market in 2008, really. A lot of people are concerned that the Bitcoin market could be manipulated and that there are a lot of allegations around saying that actual Tether, the main uh, stablecoin, could uh, be like behind a sort of fraudulent scheme that it's aimed at pumping artificially the price of Bitcoin. So I guess that you partly refer to this kind of allegations. I would like to know what Mike thinks about it. Let's first of all look at the facts. Tether has been, um, exists on the back of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was first, it's the first blockchain, first cryptocurrency. Tether right now is number three listed on coinmarketcap.com. It's about $25 billion. The significance is it's a small fraction of about the 600 billion in Bitcoin. So the fact that Tether might be manipulating the price of Bitcoin does not make sense. It's like saying that little fish is kicking the whale around. So number one, that does not make sense. And number two, look, let's look at volume on Tether. That's indicative of what the market wants. Volume on Tether is averaging a hundred and right now, $118 billion. That's compared, that's almost 70% more than Bitcoin. It's the most of everything. That's just an example of what the market wants. It wants a digital version of the dollar. It also solves a potential problem of CBDC, central bank digital currencies. China wants it, why? Because they're a communist country and they want to track every single transaction you make and by law they can. In most of the Western countries, certainly US, there's privacy laws. Tether might be solving that problem, allowing people to transact in the dollar 
without um, having to have um, issues like banks or banks just kind of allow what Fed does is allow the government allows banks to trade in dollars. So to me, the key point for me was Heather was it really hit me. I was in 2018, the market was collapsing. I was in Hong Kong. And every market was going down except Heather market cap was going up and everybody I spoke to poo pooed it. And then in 2019, the New York Attorney General came down and crushed, you know, like they were going to, it was all, it wasn't holding its funds or whatever. It was all just came down and guess what? The market didn't matter. That's when it was about $2 billion. So to me, when the market doesn't care, I don't care. And I've heard people crushing Tether forever. I've heard interviews, but it's being held by clients who want to use it and do use it. It's not exchange, it's just people. It's the global infrastructure like Bitcoin. People want to use this and they're using it. And to me, it's indicative of where everything is going to digital currencies, maybe CBDCs, but this might solve the US dollar problem of privacy. And Francis probably has some good comments on that one. <laughs> I've got quite a lot of comments on that. First one I want to pick you up on is your market cap point, because the market cap of Bitcoin also includes, of course, quite a lot of Bitcoins, rather a lot of Bitcoins that are not in circulation. They never move and some of them have been lost. So yeah, you, what Tether is influencing is your flow, not your stock. Um, so you need to be careful to compare like with like here. The actual uh, influence of Tether is on the flow, not on the stock. So I actually think that Tether could move the price. That said, um, the way in which it does so, I, I think is, is jury's out on this manipulation thing. My own analysis is slightly different. Uh, Mike, and you might be interested in this because my own view of Tether is it does um, affect price, or rather, Bitcoin price affects Tether um, because it's about because it's a volatility play. Um, yeah, and so you're going to have Tether issuance increasing on both sides of a, of a price swing, so it will tend to amplify price moves in Bitcoin. It might not start them, but it will amplify. Um, I wrote about that recently, but it, it was a bit of a nerdy point, to be honest. Um, well, <laughs> well, one thing about Tether, it facilitates trading amongst cryptos, which I'm not a mm. fan of, not a fan of trading at all. But key question I'd like to ask ourselves, what's Tether fails tomorrow? What does that mean? Mm. Sure, the whole market would collapse. It means there's only one safe store value left, Bitcoin. All that money that's left would probably go flow to Bitcoin. It's not going to XRP. <laughs> That's true. And I think that's a very fair point. I've seen that made a number, a number of times that, that if, if Tether did go down tomorrow, then, it, then the price of Bitcoin would go up, not down. And I tend to agree with that, mainly because actually I suspect it is damn difficult to get your tethers out in the form of dollars. Um, you know, I know people have this idea, if you actually look at Tether's legal documentation, they don't guarantee to redeem um, tether, USDT in the form of US dollars at all. Well, I think Tether has some serious tests coming up actually because it's got a lawsuit hanging over it and, and a further investigation by the New York, the NUI AG investigation is ongoing and it keeps on um, coming up with delaying tactics. It's just come up with another delaying tactic to try and you know, sort of delay having to produce some documents which it can't actually produce. So I wouldn't be too sure that Tether wouldn't be clamped down on yet. I think it's distinctly possible that it might be. The question is what that means yeah. for, for Bitcoin and um, like I said, the question, there were two things. One is I'm completely clear for me that there is no responsibility whatsoever from the Fed or anyone else to um, honour the, to support the tether peg. If USDT, if the tether peg breaks, nobody, absolutely nobody is going to bail out the holders of USDT in dollars. So then it's just a question of where they go with the with their tethers and whether they can buy Bitcoin with them when anybody will buy UST. Because I mean, this, you know, you've got to look at both sides of the trade here. So I think it would be incredibly disruptive for crypto markets because so much is built upon tether. And it's quite hard to see how it would play out. Um, but what I want to get across to people is no way could this be regarded as something that the Fed would bail out as it did in the shadow bank banking crisis of 2008. It's just not big enough and it doesn't pose enough of a financial stability risk at the moment. But the banks might embrace stable coins, which I heard has been recently part of legislation. I don't disagree. So there's, um, we can consider one huge side of the, um, you know, the uh, normal um, bell curve of risk. How about the other side <laughs> or something in between? 
embrace it with regulation. To me, that's more likely. And I think that's really what's mm-hmm. going to happen with Bitcoin is it's um, with the U.S., particularly because countries like China are against it. And those are countries that are major arch rivals um, and have a major issue with the reserve currency, which is the dollar. We can name many of the other ones. Thanks a lot, Francis and Mike, for the great discussion. I look forward to have you on again on our show. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. That was Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, and Francis Coppola, author and economist. I'm Giovanni, your host. If you enjoyed the interview, don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to our channel.